kids actually got their cars, and I saw some amazing shows over at the Valhalla. Wow. They had some really good stuff. You know, as we were talking today at lunch, and we kind of tracked back. Jimmy Thomas did the book, the show book, like in, like in the 50s for rock and roll. He was booking rock and roll, he just wasn't doing it at, in that facility. Later, when he got, he got management, and then later he got ownership, that's all rock and roll. It's really wonderful, along with a few other types of music mixed in. But, so we go to the Hollyhock Ballroom, which so hopefully some of you have seen. I'm Tom Torville, so if you've seen the, the book that I've written, you know, I, I kind of track it back. The owner of the Roof Garden Ballroom at Okoboji and the uh, couple who owned the Hollyhock, they were working together, working cross booking some of the same bands. That was one of the reasons the Beach Boys came to High School. And there's a long story behind how did the Beach Boys ever end up at the Hollyhock Ballroom? Scratch your head. Well, we do answer it in my, in my second book, but the, it's an interesting story. They were working together at different ballroom operators. But if you go back and look at the history of 57, 58, even the early pinnings of, of what Rock was going to try to be in 56, do you know where they were at? Ball Hall. Hall was on the Rock and Roll train long before a lot of other places were. That's kind of surprising. So uh, in my column for the uh, Pipestone County Star, I'm starting to write more about the Law Hall because they were a real deal. They were a real player in the rock and roll in this market. But that being said, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to this. As you can see, we all grew the space at the Historical Society. But that doesn't change things. I want to put up an impassioned pitch today for the Historical Society. If we were over there, we'd be passing the plate to be really honest, because you know, there's so many things they're doing. As I look back over the last 15 plus 20 years at historical societies in the Midwest, the first, the best historical society to ever understand the importance of rock and roll to us. And we were the ones that loved that, that music, and we were the ones that supported those ballrooms. They were the first ones to put up a rock and roll display and treat it as history you know, and that was controversial in some communities, I can tell you that for a fact, as history in their museum. And I've always been so impressed. And so any time any discussions ever taken place with the Historical Society and Tom Turville, I'm in. Because I, I so appreciate what they did when nobody else was doing it. Now, a lot of other historical societies kind of jumped on board after the fact. But hey, it's good. As long as it's rock and roll, it's, it's really good. So uh, it's, it's fun to have them. I'm going to ask Tr Tr Travo if you would help get, get a play or something we could do. I don't want to have anybody slip up and not have an opportunity to help our Pipestone County Historical Museum. Uh, I love the place. It's, it's, every time I go on there, it's like, what's new? And then all these things are always changing. I decided when I was talking with the Historical Museum, uh, they asked, do we, I've, I've done two presentations. I recognize a couple of people, I think, that have been with my presentations that I've done there. And I thought, it'd be more fun not to always hear from Tourville, but to uh, invite some of the people who made this music happen. The people who were our rock and roll stars, our rock and roll heroes. And if you follow my Facebook postings, that's been true. I mean, when we were kids, and if, if I'm wrong, tell me, we'd stand in front of that stage, We'd look up in a little bit of awe. We'd see those lights, good or bad. They were lights that we didn't see around the house or at the high school. And then these guys and gals that were maybe a little older than us, but just like us, they were just tearing it up, knocking the wallpaper off the walls, taking the crumb off the hubcaps. These guys were rocking our little worlds. And how special was that? You know, we'd have the big stars come on in and, and, and travel through. But when it came right down to it, it was the Pilgrims, it was Steve Ellis, it was DJ and the Runaways, it was the Stick Rays, it was all those groups that we had come through. And they were the ones that really, really honed in for us as kids. And when we saw them at our ballrooms, you remember, they were our ballrooms. They weren't the Hollywoods. It wasn't the show, but that was my ball. That's where I went. That's who I supported. That's where I had all my friends. We'd all meet there and we'd all have fun. We'd see the bands, try to sneak a few beers out of the parking lot, and we had a great night. <laughs> it was fun. And 
And those ballrooms that I'm talking about are such an important part of the lifeblood of who we were as kids. This is like pre-TV. This is pre-almost anything for as a great student does. Ballrooms for the most part don't quite work today, but some are, some are forging new paths to prove that to be wrong. And I, and I applaud them that being so great. But the truth of the matter is they were the epicenter of our entertainment for our lives. Mom and Dad went there for old time. They went there for big band. We went there for rock and roll. That's what we were looking for. We had the radio stations, and they were playing that stuff after 7 o'clock at night when nobody else really wanted to buy ads. They were playing it late at night. Remember, if we were kids, we would have those transistors, and we would tune into K-A-A-Y, put a rock hard. K-O-M-A, Oklahoma City, W-L-S in Chicago, and the real deal, the Roswell, the Wax, from W-D-G-Y in Minneapolis. You guys remember all those? Well, that was our delivery system. We always talk about how was the rock and roll delivered. First of all, it was delivered from the stage. But prior to the stage, and in and involved all the way through until the race, the, the ballrooms weren't working, we were listening on the radio. We were listening for those ads. I remember listening to KOMA ads from Oklahoma City. They were talking about the Flippers, the Red Dogs, the Blue Things, Spider-Man Friends. <laughs> what were those names? How cool was that? Sign me up. I want to be there. And it was absolutely just amazing. And so much fun. It was really fun. So those radio stations, thank you, Mylon, were such big, big players for us in our lives and how we did rock and roll. I'm going to be introducing some, in my humble, honest opinion, and I have been writing about rock and roll for over 40 years. These guys are the real deal behind me. There's a young lady back there as well that uh, I'm so happy she decided to come and participate today. It's really a treat to have her. She's going to tell us about a rock and roll from a whole different aspect. But these are the stars that I went to when I was a kid. Even one I, I grew up with and played football. When he played football, I just sat inside and watch. But it was such a good team that he starred on that they actually helped me get a partial ride at a college so for me to play football, which I got killed. And then the next thing, there was never any story after that. But we had so much fun together. I mean, it was. It was time for us to be friends, and we got together, and that was really what made it super, super special and, and a great time. So I am really pleased to say I've got 12 legitimate rock and roll stars. These are the people that, that did it. These are the people that recorded the records. These are the people that entertained us as kids, put the smiles on our faces, and it's, it's so amazing. So I'm going to go around and introduce each of them. And then I'm going to have to have a brief a minute or two and tell you a little bit about their career. I'll make you a few fun stories. But you know what? This day is going to fall flat as an old legged pancake. Unless you guys raise your hand and ask some questions. And we'd love to, we'd love to have some questions. Me, I could ask questions of them for the next two days. But I want questions from you guys. Because you guys are the special reason that we're here today. And again, thank you. Uh, would you hold that frame up for me? I want to say a special uh, comment about one of my dear, dear friends, Mr. Myra Lee. Her real name is Myra Blockensdorf. I wonder why he changed his name. What is he, Blockensdorf, but a really big, huge on, on the 45 records that he was recording? Myron's had some real health issues. He's doing well, he's fighting the fight. He wanted to be here today, and uh, he's back home in Sioux Falls. But I just wanted you to know that uh, Myra, oh, I don't know how many times he's called or e emailed me and said, I want to be there. I want to be with these guys and have this gal up here. And he did, but he couldn't. But I just want to thank Myra because he cared enough to uh, communicate, communicate, communicate that we were going to do today. So uh, it's great fun. Thank you. We're going to talk about some names of artists, some bands that you are really, that's who he played with, and that's who she is. And we're going to do that. It's going to be great fun. I'm going to go over and stand over here. Don't mind me. I'll walk around. We're going to be next. Over here on the stage are two of the real true founders of rock and roll in the Midwest. They, they together played, worked on, helped put together, record, produce, if we, if we had such a thing as produce at that time. 
One of the biggest records in the history of Midwest rock and roll. How many of you guys remember Peter Rabbit? These guys are the backbone of what really was the DJ and the Runaways. Both original founding members of DJ and the Runaways. First, Mr. Bob Godfinson. I always knew Bob playing the bass guitar, but every time I see that worthy action is shot on the USS Forrestal, and they had that, that live uh, shot of DJ and the Runaways playing Peter Rabbit up in this aircraft here. On that show, he was playing big guitars. And so he just kind of burst it up. Mr. Bob Godfinson, put your hands together. Next to him is, is probably one of the first time I saw a legitimate rock and roll band. It was on a flatbed truck, downtown Fairmont, Minnesota, Cape Corn Days, and I got to go see a band that had a record out. I was excited as a kid. I mean, this is pretty cool. I mean, these guys are the real deal. They got a record at Woolworths, 99 cents, with a picture sleeve on, mind you. And this is the guy that played the keyboards for that first group that really caught my attention, the Chevelles. How guys remember Blue Chevelle, Mad Blue, Chevelle Stop on Banger Records from Minneapolis? Same label that the Trashman, all labels the Trashman, Young Beats, all those bands were on. This is Mr. Denny Kinsey, that Denny later went become one of the real founders of DJ and other ways. He's the keyboard player that you hear of getting on that song and throughout the song uh, on Peter Rabbit, Dave Kinsey. <laughs> Sitting down in front, this is a special gentleman to me. When I was a kid, you know what they mean by the terminology being a mark? I'm a, I was a mark for this band. I mean, this band would walk, I go, wow. It, it, as, as kids growing up in Fairmont, Minnesota, we only wanted one thing. It was a story if we have time at the end, I'll be happy to share. We wanted to get Steve Ellis and the Starfires into our town, one way or the other. And we did. I'll tell you that story if we have time. This is the guy I met that night. He doesn't remember me from Adam, but I remember him. The bass player for Steve Ellis and the Starfires really walking around. It's Mr. Mike Mulligan. Garage band music. 
in the top 25 garage band songs of all time. That's not little stuff, guys. You know where they're located on it? They're out of London, England. And they were naming the Minneapolis band. The guys called the Castaways. Who had the song Liar Liar? Pretty cool when you think about it. So on that night, I went and watched the movie. I got, I got excited. So the next morning when I got up, I got my bike, I rode to downtown, went into Woolworths, 99 cents on the rack, I bought Liar Liar, Castaways 45, it had the summer records picture, or paper sleeve on it, and that yellow label, summer records, I went, whoa, is that cool? That is really, really special. Same group, I saw the other beats I'm playing on, the gestures, all on that label. But high spirits, turn on your love light, all on summer records. And what was so neat, I saw the movie on Friday. Friday morning, I bought the 45. You know what I did Saturday night? I went to Interlock and Ballroom and I saw the band. The same guys I just saw in the movie the, the night before. They were playing on stage at the Interlock and Ballroom. Yes, 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 I did get my, my 485 autograph. In fact, I was so dumb that night as a kid. I was too young to get in. So I kind of snuck in the back door. You know how I got in? I got there early when, when the Black Hearse arrived. That's cool. When the Black Hearse arrived, I actually volunteered to help the guys look up their gear, carry it in the back door. I it was a really short stage to get up on, so it was easy for me. But I got to hang around the castaways. How neat was that? So they let me sit off the side of the stage. I watched the show. And then after the first set, I, I skid out a lot of there. But in between all that, I got my 45 record sleeve autograph. And they all passed me, all four of them. And you gotta admit, that's pretty cool stuff when you're a kid. And you love rock and roll. I wasn't interested in playing in a band. I had never had that bug. So I, I learned the business of the band. Thank you, Steve Ellis. Steve Ellis helped teach me the business of, of music. I put myself through college as a booking agency. And one morning I was on the phone talking to Bruce Springsteen. He was at his breakfast table having breakfast, and I booked a date with Bruce Springsteen to plan a flatbed truck out behind the student union in Mankato, Minnesota, at Mankato State University. So I started with Mr. Steve Ellis. I didn't finish, but I went, I went to Mr. Bruce Springsteen. But back to this story. This gentleman is, is, is absolutely incredible. I'm going to show you why he's amazing. Up this year, but I got to be blunt. This book really impresses me. It's so well written. I'll be honest, I wish I could write this well. I've learned how to write. I've forced myself to learn how to write. I had fun doing it. I have fun doing it. This book is amazing. What a lot of people don't know this is Mr. Jim Donna, the co founder of the Castaways and the co writer of Liar Liar. Stand up. <laughs> Ball. 
played them all. All three ballrooms we're going to talk about today. He's been at all of them. He was the lead guitarist of a group called the Siestas. And one of their first records they did, it was a cover of the Fetterman's Mule Skitter Blues. Good morning, Captain. Yeah. Good morning to you. Uh, uh, no, I won't do that. Uh, <laughs> he is an amazing guitar player. His name is Dewey Leopold, and he spent many years with Siestas. Four forty-five records, say the least. On the Siesta label, on the Sonic Records label, and IGLs. The bottom line is they were all recorded in Milford, Iowa. But they were one of the few bands on the on that in their market with that many 45 releases out. That's so impressive. Dewey's actually was showing some of the guys some of his 45s today. It's very cool. Lead guitarist from the Siesta is Mr. Dewey Leopold. Four guys from a military academy. 
They all came with long blonde hair. Holy moly. They were recorded for roulette records. They did a great cover of Buddy Knox's Party Doll. You know what's the most important thing about the Hull Blues? They had the foresight to come in to see us in our small ballrooms. They were here at Hatfield. A band from England at Hatfield? <coughs> a band from England at Hatfield in 1965. Yeah. It's pretty cool. This is Mr. Ron Butler. In addition to that, he also played with a little band I think you might have heard of. They're called Steve Ellis and Starfighters. <laughs>
So we've given her a round of applause. I'm happy she's here. You're happy she's here. What are we going to have? The audience all set? Yeah. All right, we're going to hear from the individual <coughs> guests, I guess I'll call them, as we have them today. And they're going to tell you a little bit maybe more about their band history than I did, but I cheated and took the highlights. And then, I mean, you should ask Danny Kinsey about his life at IGL Studios. He probably produced more records at IGL Studios than any other human being. If you were a band and you recorded at IGL, Kinsey was probably turning the knobs, getting that sound just exactly what you want on four tracks, two tracks, four three tracks. tracks. Three tracks. All right, one on the drums, one on the singer, and one in the room. Well, we would we would usually do one and then one track at a time. We were producing monoral. Mono. Remember yeah. mono records, guys? No stereo here. It wasn't stereo, but uh, we would use those. We would use those tracks and mix them together. Yep. Then we get extra tracks, and then later on we did get an eight track recording <coughs> and made things a, a whole lot easier. So remember today they recorded on 86 tracks, 124 tracks. I'm not making those numbers up. Track the tracks. You go down to Nashville, you're gonna probably find 200 plus tracks. So he was working the records with IGO with three tracks. How cool is that? Think about that. We were listening to music, we were playing the records, and then we're coming off three tracks. And I tell you guys, that isn't that much different than what Denny probably saw at, at George Garrett's studio up in Minneapolis that was doing the trash. Three tracks, four tracks, maybe. So uh, we're going to hear some stories. Remember, we're going to do the last third. Yep, yeah, right on those. We're going to do the last third with you guys asking questions. And there's no room to be shy. So make sure the questions are about rock and roll. We're not, we're not taking on any other controversial subjects. Today is a rock and roll day. Mr. Gottlieson, do you want, do you, do you want, do you guys want to use the microphone? I didn't, I personally chose not to. My voice is not, I'm not afraid of hearing. So. All right, we're going to do that. Is this on? It should be. Just whoa. <laughs> we're going to start with Bob Gottlieson. And Bob's going to tell you a little bit about his career in music. We might drop a few big bands that he played with or opened for or did some work with. And then, uh, yeah, he might even tell you a story or two about the Hollywood. Woo! That could be fun. Bob Gottlieson. I live this thing. I'm, I can sing bass, so this really makes me bassy. But uh, just a couple of things go on forever, but uh, the, the best thing that ever came out was all the neat people that I've met, all the great musicians. Uh, a story about one of the ballrooms here that I uh, played years ago, the Hollyhock. Uh, I, I had my own band for the Runaways, I called the Band Elves, and we were playing Music Box in Omaha. And our manager called and he said, uh, got a child for you. If you want it, back me up Del Shannon at the Hollyhock. I said, where's that? And he said, have to go to Minnesota. And I said, where's that? <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, so we drove. That was the next night. We played in Omaha on Friday night. Had to get back up here for Saturday night. And made it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He came in. We rehearsed a little bit. And fantastic guy, tremendous musician, and he pretty much carried us. So, but that was fun. Uh, another thing with uh, DJ and the Runaways, the Chevelles that Danny played with, and my, my group, Vandells, we both lost the bass players. So, John got a hold of me and wanted to know if we wanted to join up together and form a new group, and that's when the Runaways started. No bass player. John was a good enough musician, he could play bass too, so I started out, I played bass guitar to begin with, with Runaways, and, and then I would play bass for about 15 minutes, John would play uh, guitar, for, or I'd play guitar for about a half hour, he'd play bass for 15, and we'd, get, we'd switch back and forth. So that's how that went. One of the interesting things uh, that I remember that involved one of the guys back here in the back room, we were playing uh, the Hans Park Ballroom, uh, South Paramount, uh, up the country, and one night, and uh, John said, "Got a young guy here from Fort Dodge." Sure, tell you my story. Who <laughs> 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 so, so we're going to have to sit in for a couple songs? Now that's great. You know, well, blew us away. Blew me away. 
Um, I haven't heard a voice like that before. I mean, really good. But anyway, that, that was, yeah, that, I stole your story. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, that, that, uh, that original group, uh, we just, we, be, we became good friends and, and remained that all the way through the, the years. And uh, I kept playing when I mean, we did something. 60 year reunion a few years ago. And but anyway, anymore I can't I can't handle it anymore. So but it, it's been a, a great ride and we have to play with a lot of great, great people and and big names over the years and TV shows and stuff. So anyway. Bob Godfrey said And uh, but anyway, we didn't have a phone, and I 
lived on a farm south of town, and I lived in the farm. And, uh, the next Monday after that homecoming dance, Mike wasn't in school. And I'm wondering what, you know, where's Mike? Because I was going to uh, talk to him about this dance. Though. Well, he got there on Tuesday, and his mother had taken him to Sioux Falls on Monday and bought him a Fender Precision Bass. <laughs> Right. 
about the evidence. <laughs> Spoonful and a lot of other 
Rivers. And Sonny and Cher were the headliners. And I got to meet Sonny uh, before the show. And he was nice, very, very talkative, very down to earth. And we were the opening act. And I'll tell you what, I was scared to death. I looked out. 18,000 people in the audience. And this was not your Minnesota ball. <laughs> 500 people in the audience. This was 18,000 people, and I was that nervous. But uh, as they say, the show must go on. And so, uh, yeah, we opened the act, played for 15 minutes, and uh, got the crowd warmed up. So that was probably the biggest gig that we ever had. Uh, we did 23 television appearances, uh, you know, all the Dick Clark and all that stuff. The movie that Tom told you about, we uh, had a part in that. And so the band uh, has gone on for many years. Um, I left the group in 66 to go back to the college. Um, the group broke up and reformed. And I restarted the band in around the early 70s with some new members and we've continued playing ever since. And this book here was something that I wanted to do for about 50 years and never got around to it. I finally started writing it. It took me two years during the pandemic. Tom was, as I said, was a very big help. With uh, suggestions and things, and I got to thinking now, uh, wouldn't it be a great idea to call up some of the guys, some of the bands that we do with, and see if they'd be willing to be interviewed or would write a story? So I started with Al Jardine of the Beach Boys, and he put the nicer he wrote the next word for the book. And then I got uh, a story from uh, the Love and Spoonful bass player, Steve Dillon, he wrote a very nice chapter about. Uh, the top of the show, because it says, hey, just write something. Um, as how you remember that performance when you played with the castle was the best person, and they did. So there's a lot of interviews in the book, a lot of pictures, a lot of history. And, uh, thank you very much for being here today. Stories out and close the mother can't. It's a, it's a it's a great book. I mean, I really mean it. It's a fun read. You read the book, you're in your car driving the heck. So trust me, it's 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 that road. It's, it's really really fun. Country music in our ballrooms. I love it, Mr. Dewey Label. Thank you, thank you for coming. I, I was raised on on a farm with eight kids. And you know what we do is clean barns and do day of day and stuff like that. Well, the first time I went to to here in Lake and uh, at the at the BFW, and there was a rock and roll band playing, and I I looked at up on that stage and I seen that guitar. Oh, <laughs> but I seen that guitar and it was glittered in this five strings, six strings, and people make music with that. I said that's what I got to do. And that's how I got into it. But I noticed uh, we talk a lot about uh, Ball Hall Ballroom. Well, I got a story. Um, I had just bought a brand new sports coat. That's the one I ever owned. And uh, so we were playing at the, at the ballroom. It was 25 below zero. And uh, after we got done, I told my wife, I said, where's my coat? And she had moved from one table to the next, but didn't take the coat with her. So lo and behold, in my coat was my keys to my car. <laughs> so the drummer, he said, he says, I, I, I can hot wire it for you. <laughs> so he goes out and gets it going, but the heater, the heater didn't work. So we drove home at 25 below zero.
Just so happened that his bass player was going, so I played bass for a while. 